Once upon a time, these massive houses were the ultimate statements of power and wealth of the so-called Anglo-Irish landlords and were presented as a tangible illustration of their power, hence the term Big House, in comparison to any others around. Part of that show of power were the sheer numbers of staff, the size of gardens tended, the extravagance of the banquet, the glamour of the ball, all enhanced the reputation of their owner among their peers. Uncle Edward's role with that of his father or grandfather, they had owned 20,000 acres of Westmeath. Think of the number of people who would have depended on them. And, and, and they had free agricultural estates, Longford, Kilucan in East Westmeath, and this one. This was the smallest of the agricultural estates, they had a bigger estate in Longford and here. When you think in 1876, I mean, landlords, even the owner of Mullingar, Colonel Greville, whose house, Clon Hugh, wasn't, it would be counted as a big house, but wasn't actually that big, though he did have his own little railway stop at the, at the back of his house. But they owned thousands of acres, you know, and you know, the current, not only Charles Brinsley Marley, not only had Belvedere, which was not just the present thing, but all of what's now in you know, the Gulf, the Mullingar Golf Course and the Bloomfield Hotel. He also pretty much owned the town of Kinnegad. In order to run these huge houses and estates, there had to be a small army of staff. The 1911 census in Ireland lists one in ten of all those working as domestic servants. That world below stairs has very little recorded of it. Yet it is an important time in our history. Now we can hear from just the precious few that still have memories and stories of that turbulent time in the early 20th century. The long forgotten job titles, unique skills and a tough work regime that drew in kids from as young as 13 and 14 years of age. When you came to 14 years of age, because there was no such thing as secondary education for me or anybody poor. We didn't have the transport. We didn't have the money to buy books and different things. So we had to give it a miss. Well, my father, at, when he finished national school, which was 12 years old then, he went to work in Longwoods in Glenwood with his father and his brother and his his first job his name was John Ledworth his first job was to uh, a job in the hen house feeding the hens and ducks and um, he was working for one and sixpence a week Here is a memory from Gordon Grimmett, a man who served in big country houses in the UK, who describes as a 14-year-old lamp boy his first jobs in the morning. I was up in the morning at six and Bob and I went round the house collecting the shoes. Eventually we had about 60 pairs down in the cellar waiting to be cleaned. From time to time, one of us would break off and go to a landing, fill a number of white enamel jugs with hot water and take them around the bedroom six at a time. I could manage three in each hand, though I clanked a bit. At eight o'clock, we had breakfast in the servants' hall. It was a picnic kind of meal with people coming and leaving as their duties required. After breakfast, there was knife cleaning, steel knives with bone handles. This was done with the help of a large round knife machine. After the knives, the forks, not the silver ones, of course. By now, it was quarter to nine. Time for me to dash and light the 140 candles in the chapel for one of my duties as candle boy.
Mr. Gray. He was a, 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 a wealthy landlord. He had 700 acres of land round about. The seventh Lord Cut men had over oh, half a cottage as well as Westmead. You know, oh, they them uh, type of men. Employed people all had their own jobs. Plowman and a couple of plowmen to be and be men for making hay and be men for uh, milking cows and cows, all that. They were all people who was employed, well employed and looked after, uh, well thought of, you know. I had to get up at four o'clock. We had to get ready for all the staff and we had to get the kitchen ready for Mrs. Dugdale coming down. Floor scrubbed and silver sand put down, the table with a cloth and all the knives put neatly on the table. And then she would come in and go through the kitchen and scullery and out into the larder, the game larder, back in and into the inside larder and then came down and sat at the table to look at the menus which were all in a book. We had breakfast in the kitchen and the housemaids in the hall and the housekeeper and valets and butler in the housekeeper's room. We had ours at eight o'clock. After breakfast we did more cleaning and there would be about 20 copper pans we had to clean. There were four of us in the kitchen and we did the vegetables. You can realise the amount of people who were depending on it for a livelihood. I, mean, I say 200 workers, that's not counting the kitchens and house staff. You could have another hundred in there with housemaids and I mean, it was a huge establishment. Well, when I first came here, um, the Victorian kitchen, was right down the end of that long corridor, was still the only kitchen. And there was this wonderful old lady called Mrs. Burke. And she'd been here from before the First World War. She started off as the maid who cleaned the footman's bedrooms. I mean, she could remember when there was a full Edwardian household here of two scullery maids, three laundry maids, two, um, I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, anyway, the people who cleaned the bedrooms. And then there was a butler and the footman. And there was this strange kind of inter sort of middle there. It was rather like the army. There were, you had the kind of officers who were the housekeeper and the butler and the, actually the ladies maid, the chief ladies maid was all, they were all considered kind of top, top, top dogs in the servants world. Mom, she was a ladies maid and she was a cook. She had to cover both of the, that area. She used to have to dress the lady, Mrs. Bide herself, like she had to dress her and tell her what don't wear that, that doesn't, that doesn't go with that, or something like that, honey. Yeah, my mother would have been very proud of her position. And very honoured like that, that there would be trust put in her, like for whatever job she was given. We entertained a lot. Um, you know, friends, family of the general would come and see him a lot. I remember one dinner, and I don't know who was here, but I remember we had a soup course, main or a soup course, game course, fish course, main course, dessert and cheese. I remember that really well when I kept saying, will it ever end? Will it ever end? You know, they kept coming all the time. It used to be lovely to see it going off under, you know, they went off then, when they went to the dining room, they went in dishes covered, silver dishes covered. It was lovely to see them go out the door and say, oh, thank God they're gone. You know, that's one lot out of the way. It was what you call the downstairs part of the staff. I never saw the dining room, the drawing room, the morning room, or the front hall. But that's, I mean, you just weren't, and you didn't even want to come. You would be afraid to be seen on the front of the house because it was out of your bounds. From the servants' point of view, the great meal of the day was dinner or lunch at one o'clock in the servants' hall. Everyone came to this, including the laundry maids and grooms, but excluding the nursery maids, their bad luck, and the kitchen people, 
who were cooking the dining room lunch for 1.30. Having eaten their share of the joint, the superior servants then adjourned to the cosy room where they ate their pudding. Far from being a silly arrangement, this was eminently sensible, as the lower servants could have much more fun without the uppers, and yells and screams of laughter used to come out of the servants' hall. It's very striking a house like this is organised to conceal the staff. You notice the double sets of staircases. So there's, particularly when carrying, say, a chamber pot, um, they didn't have to meet the, the gentry who were in parallel on a different staircase. And there was a back stairs for the servants to go up. They couldn't go up the front stairs. And I know I took a great like into the front stairs and every chance I got dusting or not hovering because there was no hovers uh, cleaning windows or anything I used to love going up that stair and maybe going back in old story books and that and see the, the ladies in full evening dress going up the stair My next door neighbour was a lovely lady called Molly Kelly and she told me that um, she worked in Tor House. Now that would be 1912 in around that. She said when I was 13, before I got the job as a maid in Tor House, she said, uh, and I would have just been a junior maid, she said, I would be put out to a relative. She says maybe, she says I had to go to an aunt of mine first where they would train you up, she said, and it was horrible, she said, because they really worked you hard and they didn't pay you well, and you wouldn't even be fed very well. Uh, but then when, she said, when I went to work when I was 17 and I got the job into her house, she said it was, it was like, like a privilege. Poor little devils washing up and scrubbing away at dozens of pots, pans, saucepans and plates, up to their elbows in grease, their hands red raw with the soda, which was the only form of detergent in those days. I've seen them crying with exhaustion and pain. The degradation too, I shouldn't wonder. My mother started and she would have gone as a kitchen maid, uh, it, which was what it said on the tin, you were there. Your first job in the morning was to uh, get up and light the stove for the cook and bring the cook a cup of tea in bed. And then you lit all the fires that needed to be lit and you got the downstairs going. The upstairs, kid, the upstairs maid got upstairs fires going. But you started breakfast at some level. And she progressed from that up along because she had some experience. Uh, she'd had some training in uh, what was known as husivery at the time, it would be now housewifery. These big country houses had whole layers of... Yeah. They had an agent, a farm manager, and then layers under that of sort of, as it were, foreman. And there would have been a forester looking after forestry and they would have employed about um, 20 people on the estate. And then probably 10 staff in this house butler housekeeper. Mr. Taylor, the butler, was a comedian, a joker and a leg puller. He was lean and agile. He was also a first-class butler and could switch from ragging to solemnity in a moment. He had an Irish wife and when in Ireland he mingled with the natives, went to wakes and referred to the police as the peelers. He ironed the newspapers at the table in the window by the gents. That was to dry the ink so that it did not come off on the hands. Often, you go back into Belvedere's history, you can find examples of, you know, families where, you know, a couple of generations worked there. Um, there was a friend of mine, Nor Norman Mongan, uh, author, and he had uh, a great, great aunt who was born around 1840, and when she was 16, she went to work 
in Belvedere and she probably started off as a kitchen maid but she became rose up to the position of housekeeper and held that job for many many years uh, and later on her daughter followed her into the same job. They, the, the mother went to work in Belvedere in 1856 uh, the daughter retired from working in Belvedere in 1939, so just those two, mother and daughter between them, were, worked in the employment of first Brinsley Marley and, and then Howard Bury for nearly a century. Uh, yes, I mean, it, it was a job for life. When my great grandfather came there, and my, my grandfather was the same, you done uh, so many days for Lord Castlemaine, and uh, then you had done the rest yourself. Then after that, so every every big place had their own blacksmith that time. Well, I mean, to all the basic work that had to be done in my room, you know, they had their own forge down there, you see. Uh, which was just inside the archway. Pre-World War I was a world of the horse. You went everywhere by either walking or riding a horse. The blacksmith was an essential trade, as was the groom and many stable staff to care daily for the large amount of horses in any big house. My father worked on the farm, uh, initially started to work with horses and went on then to work with, as in ploughing behind horses and doing all the farm work. And his father was also what was known as an agricultural labourer, but that meant they worked with horses because there was very little else to be done other than to work, to work with the horses, you know. My mother, when she before she married, was a lady's maid in what we call the big house, which was Gaybrook House, for an old lady called Mrs. Smith. And um, my father worked in the stable yard uh, under the watchful eye of my grandfather, who was not his father, but my mother's father. He was Will Willie Duffin. Well, he, he drove the carriage and he drove the float, that which, which was used instead of a trailer. Uh, well, it would be today's edition of a trailer. And he looked after the horses. And then my father stepped into his shoes when he, when he died. They had a lot of hunters in Gaybrook. And uh, my father used to break them and he used to ride uh, he used to ride the horses out and so or, or whatever men were uh, working under him and there seemed to be an awful lot of men and uh, both in the stable yard and then the farm there was a farmyard uh, uh, I suppose half a mile away and there seemed to be a lot of men there too and my father raised the cow over there my mother said that uh, it, it, it was considered more desirable to be in service in a big house than to be, for instance, working in a shop. From a child's point of view, it, it was a, a, a child's paradise because there were these amazing spaces great long staircases with with well polished handrails you could slide down and uh, a, a gloomy cavernous basement that was sort of full of sort of spooks and terrors and um, places that you could play and hide and and I mean we could drive our bicycles around the hall great grandfather uh, was living with his 26-year-old son, his 27-year-old son, his 23-year-old daughter and his wife and his 68-year-old brother in three rooms, which had four windows. And Featherston was up the road, living with his wife and his daughter and eight servants 
in 15 rooms that had 20 windows. You know, so and I never even questioned it until I started to think about it. And I, I started to look at it and say, well, is it any wonder there was resentment? But all this opulent world was about to come to an abrupt end. Debts accumulated over the past 20 or 30 years, a downturn in the economy and a rapidly changing political scene would take away the traditional hold of the landowners of old. In 1900, the, their circumstances of the, of the people in the big houses had changed dramatically for several reasons. First of all, um, politically, they had lost their political power uh, nationally because of uh, political reforms, the um, various electoral acts, and then and also the local government act. They lost their power at local level. From 1905, they had, were losing and finally lost all their estates, and with it all the prestige and power that went with large landed estates. The political situation would have also had a bearing on, especially at the time of the home rule crisis, uh, that was the only from what, from year that all the families that I was uh, re looking at sold land in 1912. So maybe that was a harbinger of what was to come, uh, that they said maybe it's time we should think about maybe leaving Ireland if the situation, if home rule came in, because that was at the, at, you know, we won't be welcome here, we mightn't be wanted, we might be under threat. In 1914, the drums of war were beating in the distance and many people above and below stairs in the big house would be caught up in a decade of huge upheaval in Irish history. In part two, we will delve into the emerging new world during and after the First World War and its tragic effects on Westmead's big house world. Thank you.